Media, an ancient Persian kingdom, emerged as a cohesive state all the way back in the late 7th century BC. Known for their unique skills in horse breeding, the Medes played a crucial role in the downfall of the Assyrian Empire through alliances with other powers, including the Babylonians. The Median Kingdom eventually fell to Cyrus the Great of Persia, marking the rise of the Persian Empire. However, its legacy lived on through the administrative and cultural contributions that it left behind for the Persian system. No one really talks about the Medes anymore, and they're one of those forgotten civilizations. If you want to learn about them, you've come to the right place. Because I'm going to tell their story the best I can. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's time for another video together. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, head on over to the Patreon. And if you want to like, comment, and subscribe, well, you can do that too. Now get yourself comfortable, because we now tell the story of the history of the Medes. As the second millennium BCE drew to a close, Midian tribes began to establish themselves in the area that would later become known as Media located in what is now western Iran. By the 9th century BCE, this region had caught the attention of the Assyrians, who frequently launched invasions and conducted raids across the area. This area of northwest Iran was dotted with numerous small principalities at the time, it was in 834 BCE that the Assyrian texts first recorded mention of the Medes, during the reign of Shalmaneser III, who encountered the Medes in the Hamadan Plain, following a military expedition. The Medes at this time were organized into various small groups led by tribal chiefs, and although the Assyrians did manage to subdue several of these leaders. They never really conquered the Midian lands fully. One notable conflict occurred in 815, when Shamshi Adad V led a campaign against the kingdom of Sagbita, deemed the royal city of the Midian chief Hane Shuruka. This assault resulted in significant destruction and loss of life, with Assyria imposing a tribute on the Median tribes henceforth, demanding horses, cattle, and the handicrafts that they had realized the Medes were so good at. The focus on Assyrian military efforts began to shift towards Media, influenced by the Urartian expansion around Lake Urmia. But despite all their efforts, and they were trying, the Assyrians failed to stop the group called the Urartians, and even allied with Menea against Urartu, marking a period of unsuccessful campaigns led by Adat Ninari III against the Medes which in turn contributed to a burgeoning political crisis within Assyria. Later, under the leadership of Tiglath-Pileser III, Assyria initiated the organization of provinces in the conquered territories, aiming to secure a steady income and a foothold for further expansion. This strategy brought the Assyrian Empire closer to the heart of Media, establishing new provinces, 
and demanding tribute from the Median and Menaean rulers. Tiglath Pileser's campaigns extended deep into the Median territory, resulting in imposition of tribute on the Medes, and the deportation of thousands from northwest Iran to regions as far away as Phoenicia and Syria. During the reign of Sargon II, from 722 to 705, the Assyrian Empire's influence in Media reached unprecedented heights. You see, Sargon's strategy involved exerting direct control over those distant lands by implementing the provincial administration system that had proved very effective in closer and more easily managed territories. In this system, Assyrian governors were appointed alongside the existing local rulers, with governors likely overseeing aspects such as long-distance trade and taxation, while the local city lords managed the day-to-day -day affairs within their domains. In 716, Sargon established the centers of the new Assyrian provinces at Harhar and Kishasim, incorporating additional territories from western Media, including Sagbeta. These provinces, in their tongue, were named Kar Sarukin and Kar Nurgal. Now, this leads us on to Sargon's successor, Sennacherib, who ruled from 704 to 681 BC, and he actually adopted a less aggressive stance in the region, indicating a possible stabilization of Assyrian control over these new provinces of Karnergal and Karsarukin, post-713 BC at least. The system that paired Assyrian provincial governance with local Median rulers appeared to achieve a pretty good balance, at least in function. But, of course, it still had to maintain Assyrian dominance over territories established by tiglath pileser and Sargon II up to the time of Esarhaddon. Sennacherib's campaign in 702 against the Zagros kingdom of Elipi marked his sole direct engagement with the Medes, from whom he received a decent amount of tribute. The Assyrian records consistently depict the Medes in this fashion, residing in settlements governed by city lords called Bel Lalani hinting at the emergence of a centralized authority among the Medes through their interactions. This dynamic likely facilitated the development of a more structured, political and economic organization among the Median people, pushing them further and further towards a entity that resembled a state rather than just a tribe that's added to the list of conquered peoples. But this was still early days. We'll get there, don't worry. This evolution was partly driven by the necessity to respond to continuous Assyrian aggression, which also underscored the strategic importance of trade routes passing through Media, and there were plenty of them. The thriving east-west trade, especially in luxury items like lapis lazuli from Bactria, well that just shows the evidence we have how important this area was, and in later times it eventually catalyzed the unification under Ekbatana, I'm sure you've heard that name before, as its central city. Those who've watched Bronze Age history 
I'm sure you've heard the name Ecbatona before. And now for a source that isn't a Persian source. Herodotus, who tells us of the story of Diocese, who leveraged a period of lawlessness in Media to establish himself as a just and impartial judge, winning widespread acclamation. However, when he s stopped rather abruptly offering his judicial services, complete chaos broke out, compelling the Medes to convene and ultimately elect Diocese as their king. So much for his retirement. Well, following his elevation, Diocese ordered the construction of Ecbatana, centralizing all governmental power within its walls. Despite the intrigue of this tale, it comes from Herodotus, so, you know. Contemporary texts and archaeological evidence don't really support the existence of a unified Median state under Diocese in the early 7th century BC. It just... it's just not there. And like a lot of stuff you read in Herodotus, it's likely more of a legend than a history. But it is a fun one. And if it's fun, it goes in the video. Now, in contrast, Cesias, another source that wasn't Persian, offers a narrative about Arbaces, a Mede who rose through the ranks of the Assyrian army to become the governor of all of the Medes. Sensing the Assyrian king Sardanapalus's vulnerability, Arbaces, along with his ally Belisus, a Babylonian, staged a rebellion that led to the foundations of the Median kingdom. Although Assyrian records do not mention individuals like Arbaces or, in fact, Dioses, these names were actually pretty common at the time, and can't really be definitively linked to figures described by Greek historians. Think of these two names, Dioses and Arbaces as David and Aaron. If you were going to say, oh, you are from... You're from London. Oh, do you know Daniel? It's kind of like this. Very common names. Now, the stories of Herodotus and Cesias diverge significantly from Near Eastern sources, which, once again, just casts a little bit more doubt on their historical accuracy. Now, on to the reign of Asarhaddon, which saw several forays into Iranian lands, though these expeditions were less consequential than those of his predecessors. Around 676, and before 672, he received tribute from city lords of Partaka, Partuka, and Ura Kazabarna, who sought Assyrian support against their rivals. Esarhaddon's campaign reached as far as the Caspian Sea, and even all the way to the Salt Desert near Mount Bikni. His diplomatic efforts, including securing oaths of loyalty, in 672 from various Median chiefs aimed at ensuring their allegiance to the Assyrian throne. This pact, interpreted by some as a vassal treaty, may have originated from the internal Median conflicts and the strategic positioning of Median warriors within the palace guard of Assyria. These Median chiefs pledged their loyalty to Esarhaddon and his heir, Ashurbanipal. These are some big names, huh? Doing my best. 
Now, during Esarhaddon's rule, Assyrian textual sources depict a highly volatile situation along the empire's eastern frontiers. After 713 BC, although it was customary for Assyrian governors to venture into the Zagros provinces to collect tribute, such missions became a little bit risky under Asarhaddon's administration. This increased danger was not just due to traditional foes like the Medes and Menaeans, but also because of the presence of new threats such as the Cimmerians and Scythians within Iran. A significant concern of Assyria was Kashtaritu, the city lord of Karakashi. His name frequently appears in oracle inquiries related to Median affairs, highlighting him as a political figure of considerable sway. Esar Haddon was particularly anxious about Kashtaritu's potential alliances with other Median city lords, and, of course, his capacity to launch assaults on Assyrian strongholds. Now that being said, the historical records remain a little silent on whether the conflicts with Kashtaritu were resolved peacefully or through military means, and that suggests perhaps an unfavorable outcome for Assyria. Think about it. They'll only show you the highlight reel, right? And unfortunately for Assyria, well, all their other victories were always written down. Very keen to tell people about the times they win. Not so keen to talk about it when they lose. Now, this period in general saw a general decline in Assyrian control in the east, exemplified by the loss of Sabarda, which had been incorporated into the province of Harhar in 716 BC. Dusani, the city lord of Sabarda, along with Kashtaritu, were noted as adversaries of Assyria in various oracle queries, indicating Assyria's diminishing grip on these far-flung provinces. And now, to a more familiar name. Under Ashurbanipal, who reigned from 668 to 630, references to the Medes in Assyrian sources drastically reduce. His annals, these annals of Ashurbanipal, mention the defeat and capture of three rebelling Median city lords during his fifth campaign in 656, marking the last recorded mention of the Medes in Assyrian historical records. The description of these leaders as city lords suggests that the Median political structure had remained at least somewhat consistent since the 8th century, though it remains pretty unclear whether the Assyrian provinces in the Zagros, such as Parswa, Bithamban, Kishasim, and Harhar, that Kishasim and Harhar are references in uh, Karnagal and Karsarokin respectively, remained under Assyrian dominion during Ashurbanipal's reign. Although Assyrian texts from this period later do not extensively mention the Iranians, implying a possible decrease in Assyrian interest or concern for them, the gradual loss of control over the Zagros province may have paved the way for the emergence of a unified Midian state. Despite the somewhat lack of Assyrian documentation on a consolidated Median realm akin to the major powers of the time like, for example, Elam, Manea, Uratu, and Assyria itself. 
Well, the majority of scholars are pretty hesitant to dismiss Herodotus, Herodotus's narratives completely, and the possibility is open that his accounts hold some historical merit. Some historical merit. Well, around 40 years following their last mention in Assyrian texts, the Medes re-emerged in historical records by 615. This time, under the leadership of one Ciazares, they launched an offensive against the Assyrian core territories and formed an alliance with the Babylonians. The rise of Ciazares as the leader of a unified Median force is not really talked about in the Assyrian sources which are conveniently silent on the internal and foreign policy dynamics of Assyria during the latter half of the 7th century. The absence of records leaves us with quite a gap in understanding of the events that led to the Median consolidation under Ciaxares, but once again, only show the highlight reel. Now, this period, from 670 to 615, possibly under Ashurbanipal or his successors, is speculated to have been crucial for the formation of a unified Median state. And this scarcity of records leads us to Herodotus, particularly regarding Siaxares. Now, his depiction of Ciaxares and the latter's significance in the downfall of Nineveh is supported by several Babylonian chronicles, lending a little bit more weight to Herodotus's betrayal of Ciaxares' reign and his leadership over this new united Median entity. Herodotus also recounts that Deoxes was succeeded by his son, Fraortes, suggesting a possible misalignment in the sequence of events or the conflation of achievements across regions, reigns rather. Well, all in all, this narrative essentially proposes that the actual unification of the Median tribes and the establishment of Media's capital may have been the work of Deoxys' successor, rather than Deoses himself. While Fraotes has been associated by some with Kashiritu, that figure evolved in the revolt against the Assyrians in 672, timelines are a little bit hazy, and they unfortunately don't leave us with any coins to show the reigns of certain kings which is usually the easiest way of getting the things right. Oh well, uh, maybe we'll find something later on. Now, the consensus at least, as of 2024, among some historians, suggests that it was under Ciaxares, purportedly the son of Fraortes, that the Medes had unified with the rain beginning in 625. Well, around that time, the Syrian state was facing a whole lot of difficulties, and continued to do so from 627 onwards, and the Medes took the advantages that they could, and it seems that they were somewhat solidified after 631. Now, this period for Assyria was marked by instability in both domestic and Babylonian fronts. And it was only the most prudent decision that the Medes would consolidate power in the vacuum that was quickly forming. Now, on to a different geographical setting. In ancient times, the expansive regions of the north of the Black and Caspian Seas, were populated by the Scythians, and I've done a whole video on them if you want to go watch it. 
But in the late 8th and 7th centuries BC, these nomadic warriors decided to venture from the Caspian Sea and Black Sea areas into western Iran, which of course significantly influenced the course of the region's history during the Iron Age. Now this era, particularly the involvement of the Scythians in western Iran's plateau, is noted as a very important time. Herodotus mentions a period of Scythian dominance, which ostensibly occurred within the Median dynasty's lineage. However, once again, the exact timing of this interregnum is debatable, with estimates ranging from 635 to 615, and some people more putting it around 653 to around 620. Once again, we wait for further confirmation. Now Herodotus narrates that Fraortes, a Median king, had launched his unsuccessful attack against Assyria, during which he and a large portion of the army were killed. Following this, his successor Siaxares sought to avenge his father, by laying siege to Nineveh, at the time the Assyrian capital. But they were thwarted. By who? Well, the Scythians, of course. A Scythian force led by Madies, resulting in the Medes' defeat. And the Scythians, of course, seized control over the region. The Scythians' rule was marked by a great deal of harshness and heavy taxation, leading Siaxares to strategize their overthrow by inviting the Scythian leaders to dinner. And when they got there, he made sure they ate and drank as much as possible, especially drank as much as possible because his plan was to get them all drunk and then kill them all, killed to death. And it worked. And as with all great plans for revolution, rivers of blood followed by eternal paradise. Good job, Siaxares. Now, the narrative suggests that the Scythians' rule was somewhat transient, and they possibly ended due to their voluntary withdrawal, or perhaps simply their absorption into a growing Median confederation. While Herodotus assigns a 28-year period to Scythian domination, this duration is highly improbable due to the nomadic nature of the Scythians who were unlikely to maintain control over large territories for such a long period of time. I mean, it could have happened, but uh, the Scythians generally did not like that. It is argued, however, that the Scythian presence in western Iran was much, much shorter, with the Medes quickly regaining their strength and territory shortly after the Scythians, well, the ones that were left after the dinner party decided to unhinge their horses and ride away to their next adventure. Which leads us to the death of Ashurbanipal, which of course was going to affect the Medes as well as it affects everybody. He died in 631 and the Assyrian Empire faced a significant political instability, setting the stage for the Babylonian Rebellion led by Nabopolassar in 626. Now he was initially the governor of the southern regions, and emerged as a key figure in this revolt, and soon recognized as well as the King of Babylon. Lofty title, I know. While he succeeded in taking control of Babylon, his dominion over all of Babylonia wasn't immediate. 
and he was necessitated in making alliances against the Syrian force. Now Herodotus mentions the death of the Median king Fraortes around this time, 625, during an unsuccessful attack on Assyria. What does that mean? Well, that hints that there was Median-Assyrian conflicts at this time, and they could have been allied with Babylon. But these specific details on the Medes' relationships with the Assyrians at this time, or their geographical positioning relative to the Assyrian heartland, remains a little, a little sparse. Now, by 616, the Babylonians had scored significant victories against the Assyrians, whether they had help from the Medes or not, but it does suggest, and it looks fairly, fairly obvious, that they had coordination with them. The mention of the Medes near Arava in 615 hints at a collaborative stance between the Medes and Babylonians implying a strategic approach towards the Assyrian strongholds. And they were big. There were some serious fortresses for the time, but give them the credit that was due. Now the pivotal moment came in 614, when the Medes under Cyaxares launched a successful campaign against Assyria, capturing key cities, before a joint effort with the Babylonians aimed at Assur. This period of cooperation included a formal alliance between Nabopolassar and Siaxares, reportedly sealed by the marriage of Siaxares' daughter Amethyst to Nebuchadnezzar II, who was Nabopolassar's son. The narrative from 613 to 612 shows fluctuation in the mentions of the Medes in historical records, but it does culminate in a significant role during the siege and fall of Nineveh in 612. Post Nineveh, while the Medes did return to their land, the Babylonians weren't done partying yet, and they continued the campaigns eventually even securing a defensive victory against the Assyrians and the Egyptians at Carchemish in 605 BC. Once again, the extent of Median involvement in this final defeat remains unclear, and if there was anyone saying that there was Median involvement, it is perhaps due to a little bit of speculation. So what happened when Assyria fell? Well, the aftermath saw most of its territories immediately come under Babylonian control, challenging earlier views that the Medes and Babylonians divided Assyrian lands equally. There is evidence, including the Babylonian Chronicle, suggesting that the Medes did take control of the regions primarily in Zagros, with subsequent narratives indicating possible Median dominance in Haran. And by the late 7th century, the Medes had evolved into a formidable political entity, underscored by their joint conquest with Babylon. The nature of the Median political organization during this period still remains a little bit debatable. We don't quite have enough evidence to really say for sure. While some argue for a sophisticated empire modeled after Assyrian imperial structures, others suggest that the Medes were a significant military force without much of a development for state institutions. This debate centers around the time from the fall of Nineveh in 612 up to the Persian conquest of Ecbatana in 550. Sorry about the spoilers. A period where the Median Empire's existence is inferred, but once again 
poorly documented. Now, despite the lack of these detailed records, which is of course a real shame, evidence from Babylonian and Biblical texts confirms the Medes' critical political influence in the post-Assyrian Near East, putting them aside Lydia, Egypt and Babylon as one of the four dominant powers. Their expansion established a direct border with Lydia and central Anatolia, indicated by hostilities traced back before a solar eclipse in 585, suggesting Median conquest of Manea and Urartu prior to 590. The possibility that the Medes, rather than the Babylonians, attacked Urartu around 609 is supported by some interpretations of the Babylonian Chronicle, and hints at a coordinated effort with Babylon to extend Median influence into Anatolia itself. The destruction of Urartu, often attributed to the Medes, alongside the decline of the Cimmerian power in Cappadocia, facilitated their expansion into Asia Minor. This expansion set the stage for conflict with Lydia, leading to a war punctuated by a notable solar eclipse during the battle, prompting peace negotiations mediated by influential figures from both Babylon and Cilicia. The resulting treaty established the boundary of the Halys River between Media and Lydia, solidifying a new regional power balance through strategic marriages and alliances. Herodotus suggests that under Syaxare's leadership the Medes extended their control across a vast region, conquering territories as diverse as Cappadocia and Urartu, along with various peoples and tribes in the area, potentially including the Tiberane, Macrones, Mushki and the Mares, along with a few other smaller tribes. Now, following Siaxare's death and the peace treaty with Lydia, Astyages ascended to the throne. His reign is even less documented than his predecessors. Sorry, what do you want me to tell you? It's marked, though, by significant family alliances through his marriage to Aryenis and his sister Amethyst's marriage to Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon. These connections, however, did not preclude tensions with Babylon, as suggested by expectations of a Median invasion in the 590s reflected in Jeremiah's speeches. Old Testament stuff, yeah. Now, Astyage's reign also saw the significant marital alliance with the Achaemenid dynasty, through the marriage of his daughter, Mandane to Cambyses I, potentially connecting him to Cyrus the Great. We'll get back to him later. Efforts to consolidate and centralize Median power during Astyage's rule might have faced opposition from the tribal nobility, contributing to the kingdom's vulnerability. And furthermore, Astyage's military campaigns, including those against the Caducians and the Sakai, underscore this ongoing challenge from both nomadic and settled adversaries, and it suggests the Medes had maintained a defensive posture along their northern borders near the Caspian Sea. Despite a relatively stable reign, Astyages eventually faced internal and external pressure, and it culminated in conflicts such as the Armenian King Tigranes, although these accounts are considered a little less reliable. Herodotus and Cessias 
represent the conflict between the Medes and the Persians as an extended uprising, with Cyrus II leading Persia against Median dominance, a portrayal not directly corroborated by contemporary sources, mind you. The Nabonidus Chronicle, a closer-to-the-event account, records that in 550, Astyages launched a campaign against Cyrus specifically for conquest. But his troops were not having it, and I think this is rather hilarious. Apparently, while he was trying to rouse them up and say, guys, we're going to war, we are going to take out Cyrus, and we are going to take the spoils, the troops revolted captured him, bailed him up, and delivered him straight to Cyrus. I mean, talk about disobeying orders, right? Of course, all of this led to the capture of Ecbatana by Cyrus. Well, and it certainly also suggests this sudden end to Median rule in this rather sad and embarrassing manner. Now, Babylonian records, focusing on titles and identities, distinctly recognize Cyrus as the king of Anshan and Astyages as the king of the Medes, without hinting at familial connections that Herodotus sometimes attributes to them. And this discrepancy raises a few questions about the historical accuracy of Herodotus's version, particularly his betrayal of Cyrus as both Astyages' vassal and grandson. Yeah, Herodotus's proofreading is a little bit strange. But it's fun. Leave him alone, it's okay. Now this revolt of the Median army which was pivotal in the transition of power, may have stemmed from a lot of broader societal changes within the Median and Persian realms. By the 6th century, Iranian tribes were increasingly adopting more settled lifestyles, as in they weren't nomadic anymore, and their leaders were taking on more regal roles and behaviours distinct from the traditional tribal chiefdom customs. Astyage's punitive actions against these emerging leaders likely fueled more than a little bit of discontent, setting the stage for a rebellion that facilitated the ascent of Cyrus and the establishment of a Persian supremacy over Media. So, Cyrus following the victory over Astyages and the seizure of Ecbatana, transferred all of its wealth back to Anshan, stripped the whole city. The true breadth of territories that came under Cyrus's control through conquest is something that we're not really sure, especially around Media, but it did potentially encompass vassal states like Armenia, Cappadocia, Parthia, Arya, and Drangiana. The legitimacy of Cyrus's rules could partly be attributed to his familial ties with Astyages, a connection that may have been fabricated or exaggerated to justify the Persian dominance over the Median territories. Further narratives, such as the ones from Tsesias, introduce another layer of complexity by suggesting that Cyrus married a daughter of Astyages, possibly named Amethyst, to solidify his claim to the throne. No other reason but that. A strategic alliance. Well, it certainly is a recurring theme in the consolidation of power, especially in Near Eastern politics. Well, Cyrus, he didn't stop at Media. He soon confronted Croesus of Lydia, extending Persian control even further west and eventually even conquered Babylon. The rapid succession of conquests, 
sort of lends to his namesake. And it highlights his formidable leadership and a good deal of military skill. He was not messing around. In the aftermath of all of these conquests, the Medians were still around, and they enjoyed a pretty prominent status within the Achaemenid Empire, albeit not as independent as they used to be. They weren't just a major province, but they were also the favoured residence for the Persian kings. But all the privilege of that position didn't prevent the internal unrest. The beginning of Darius the Great's reign was marked by widespread revolts across the empire, including a significant one in Media, led by a pretender also named Freotes, who claimed descent from Siaxares. Despite all the initial successes, Fra Fraortes, rather, was quelled by Darius, and it culminated in his rather violent execution. This, of course, discouraged other people from having any bright ideas of their own. But it was this revolt that was among the last major challenges to Achaemenid authority. The final frenzied swing from the Medians. Well, thank you very much for listening. All of the strategic and cultural significance indeed endured beyond the empire, but it was pretty much melded into the Seleucid and Parthian empires. I don't think I've done a video on the Seleucids yet. I should do that. Did we have fun? That's the end of the history of Media. I'm sure you had a great time. I'd like to thank my mega Chad dear patrons. You ought to see these guys. They're the biggest Chads. That's JC. Stark Factory. And Jeffrey. Three Chads, indeed. If you would like to enjoy status among these three Chads, you need only look at the description and comments for the links to the Patreon, and you too can be world famous by being mentioned in the ASMR Historian video. <laughs> Thanks again for listening this far. I'm having fun making these videos. Really. It's not become simply just an enjoyment, but somewhat of a moral obligation can't stop. Good night, everyone. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.